Hi, I'm Toby. Welcome to my place. I love Doctor Who and ice cream. Now, I can't share my ice cream with you, but I've got a whole host of Doctor Who. And I've got a friend to choose a story for us to watch. They've also identified their favourite things about this story. So as we watch along, and I'll chat to you, we're going to see if we can identify what it is we think that my friend thinks is so special about this particular adventure. Thanks for joining me for episode three. Just a quick reminder what the story is, why it's been chosen, and who chose it. Hello, my name's Chris Boyle, and I'm a full-time A-level law teacher and an incredibly part-time comedian and podcaster. The story that I've chosen is The Den of the Daleks, and the reason I've chosen that is because I do have problems uh, with the third Doctor. Um, he should be my favourite. He's played by John Pertwee, he wears velvet jackets, he does incredibly complicated fight sequences whilst holding a glass of whiskey, and yet more often than not I find him a bit pompous and a bit superior, and it gets on my nerves. So I'm going to see if I can find the positives in a third Doctor story. Well, welcome. It's episode three of Day of the Daleks. I left you on a cliffhanger last time, but when I do the reprise from the cliffhanger, uh, there's not going to be a musical sting. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there is, however, hopefully now, the opportunity for you to press play, which you will do on Day of the Daleks, episode three, in three, two, one, now. So, um, the eagle-eared amongst you uh, will notice that I got carried away talking about all sorts of things because the clip of the Doctor and the Ogram at the end of, towards the end of episode two was the one that they used on the BBC News to report John Pertwee's death. And the BBC arts correspondent, Nick Hyam, said uh, something along the lines of, uh, the sets may have wobbled and the acting may not have been up to much, but... For many children, John Pertwee was Doctor Who. You think, that is such a snide attitude to take. I've never understood people who work in sort of arts journalism uh, who, who speak about television as though it's something that they've just trodden in. Um, if, if you don't like it, don't, uh, don't take the shilling writing about it. There are so many brilliant people, um, uh, and there's so many, especially today, in sort of fandom and on social media, looking at something written by John Williams, who's a, who's, he's a, he's a friend of mine, but I, I came into contact with him because of Tacky on TV, which is a podcast he did. But he's a brilliantly knowledgeable fellow about television, and he's a really good writer, and he's probably a better writer and knows more about TV than half of the people, most of the people out there who write about television. Um, uh, and I find it really odd that the sort of television critic's job is often given to somebody that used to do the motoring column or, you know... And it, so you, you can get the job of being, you know, a broadsheet papers, newspaper, uh, 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 television critic without having seen I, Claudius or Edge of Darkness. You wouldn't, you wouldn't become the food columnist if you didn't know what an aubergine was. Um, so anyway, Nick, yeah, Nick Kayyem yeah, said that about, uh, 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 you know, Doctor Who and John Pertwee. And, and, and it, was, it was during the wilderness years when it was, it was lazy and uh, shorthand to sort of go, you yeah, know, Doctor Who is a bit naff. But... To do that when you're sort of paying tribute to a much-loved uh, artist who has just died, who entertained generations of children in a programme that has uh, made a huge impact and created cultural iconography, I think um, d deserves a bit of a kick up the backside myself. Uh, so I just wanted to get that off my chest. Uh, hopefully that wouldn't happen now because Doctor Who is, is a bit more fashionable. Scott Fredericks, I haven't mentioned yet, the beautiful Scott Fredericks, uh, who returns to Doctor Who in Image of the Fendal. Uh, he's, got, he's got a great sort of, he's got a great face for this sort of part, but also he's, uh, in, in Blake Seven, uh, he's uh, a character called Carnell. 
Um, I'm not a massive Blake Seven fan. Well, I not. I mean, I like it, but I don't know much about. I don't know much about it, <laughs> except I know some of the people who are guest stars, and yeah, I can name all of the actors. Okay. Um, yeah, I like. Yeah, Blake Seven. Um, he's a character in a, an episode called Weapon. I think is it the one with with John Bennett that he's this sort of logic chess champion guy who who predicts. Uh, he predicts what people will do, and uh, Serverland hires him. And he, he rather uh, charmingly he realizes that she's going to kill him at the end. So he he, he preempts that, and he and he and he scoots off. And so I think she's quite turned on by that. And he's he's kind of there is a bit of an undercurrent to them. Uh, uh, and that's a great sort of one episode character. Um, uh, and he and he's and he's very good in Image of the Fendal as Max Steil, the. Uh, the uh, the inscrutable German bad guy. So um, yes, and I. They have escaped. Yeah, that's how we talk now. Um, I wonder if there was a take of that. They have escaped, my lord. Uh, <laughs> Bye, Jingo. Um, oh yeah, the, this is where the Doctor gets a look at the dystopian future. There's a lot of Ogrons, aren't there? You forget because I always think there's only Rick Lester. <laughs> um, they are quite, uh, there's quite a number of them, and uh, this location stuff um, in the desolate Earth future. Um, but I, yeah, I, Scott Fredericks, I did meet briefly at the, when they showed the, the special edition of this um, uh, at uh, somewhere in the South, no, not the South Bank, somewhere, it doesn't matter. You can't go, you can't go there now, it was in the past. Um, uh, and I had a, a brief chat with him, and he knew who Rob Shearman was, which was rather fun. And he'd been a bit poorly, so he wasn't he wasn't quite as sort of r robust as he as as uh, and he wasn't as young uh, as I imagined. And he he died a couple of years ago. Um, and I meant to ask him for his autograph, and I didn't because because I just didn't. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. I was lucky to meet him, but my fan little completion niggle goes you had the opportunity to get the autograph of an actor you liked and you didn't i didn't reader i didn't um uh, see this is that the the the, the percent of scale and perspective is different here suddenly aubrey wood seems sort of cramped and subservient even because he's having to stoop slightly even though the daleks are shorter than him but they're sort of like malevolent little mites um flanking him you know it's good yeah, what it does with scale, this story. And the vision mixing is interesting. And, and I know that Steve Bruster was keen to get Mike Catherwood, the vision mixer, on the extras. And I think he's on the commentary. And I think they do a little documentary, don't they, as well? Because it's a story where the vision mixing is quite important. And I like the fact that the DVD does that, you know, that uh, you, you can examine different areas of Doctor Who production, um, uh, especially if there's a story where it's particularly appropriate to talk about those things. Um, oh yes, I, yes, I've forgotten those little bits on the on the screen filming the Doctor, um, and I, I I think this is this of course talking of the DVD. This is where I make the erstwhile mistake. I I I, I nipped over to Birmingham to do something, and I, 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 I and, and I did these voiceovers for Steve, and. Um, and there's a line that refers to your erstwhile producer, which we'd used in the sense of how Doctor Who fans have used it, which is to mean sort of dogged and doughty. And it doesn't mean that at all. It's got the word while in it. It means former. But because we as Doctor Who fans, I think the theory is, I haven't come up with this, Gary Gillett did, I think, um, is that we, we say, we think erstwhile means, means doughty and loyal because there was a picture of Sergeant Benton that referred to him as the erstwhile Sergeant Benton, but that meant that he used to be Sergeant Benton, but since Robot was Warrant Officer Benton, so he was a former Sergeant, an erstwhile, and it's got the word while in it, uh, <laughs> which doubts it, which doubts and dogged does not. Um, and anyway, so we have used erstwhile to mean that, loyal, whatever, doughty, dogged. Um, and I thought it was a very Doctor Who thing and it was a mistake and it's in the script and I read it out. I was tired and I was rushing from one thing to another, but neither of those things 
are enough mitigation. I have to say I was party to a mistake. Um, and as somebody with an English degree, it's quite an embarrassing one, but I have to own it, even though I didn't write the script. So I'm sort of owning it whilst going, but I didn't write the script, but I did say it out loud. Um, uh, but I've since, I've since had erstwhile used to me in that context, uh, in the environs of the BBC, used in a script by somebody that has never seen Doctor Who. So isn't that funny that that mistake has replicated itself or rippled out. Can't all have rippled out from Doctor Who magazine, can it? And somehow entered the life of that person in the BBC who was talk who, who, who used in a script that it's your erstwhile agent here, but it was meaning your hard-working agent. And, and in fact, I went, uh, I think that's a very creepy look, the, uh, the uh, shiny space lady gives, um, who is paid by Deborah Brayshaw, who um, for years was an actress that we, I didn't know where she was and couldn't find, but I, I did a podcast interview with somebody recently. He said, oh, that's my friend's mum. So I sent out a sort of a plea going, oh, tell us to get in touch. I'd love to interview her. But it's, it's the, 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 the call into the wild. I don't know if it was passed on, uh, but she hasn't bitten. Um, I'm always on the lookout to catch an actor we haven't spoken to before. One of the rare examples of smoking in Doctor Who. Um, which as a kid I thought was terribly grown up. I loved it when people had a fag in Doctor Who because it enabled me to tell my friends who thought Doctor Who was a children's programme, no, they have smoking and everything. It's all grown up. Um, and I do quite like it as a, as a touch. It's like the rare occasions there's blood, blood and smoking. That's, that's, that's what grown ups do. Um, and Valentine Palmer here playing Monia. Now in the book, he's Moni. In this, he's Monia. In the closing credits of the BBC video Omnibus Edition, he becomes, because I guess Valentine is, is not a name, perhaps the credits person associated with uh, maleness, maybe. Uh, he's credited as Monica. Um, that guard that we briefly saw there was an actor of who did a lot, George Raystrick. Um, it's his only Doctor Who. Uh, he had a great career as a character actor, worked for the RSC, played played uh, sort of the, the clownish parts in, uh, in various Shakespeare's for the RSC and died, if not on stage, backstage, he was working in a play with Bernard Cribbins. And I remember being very cross because he was in a, an episode of a thing called The Vet a couple of, that month, but after his death had been announced and he was a sort of guest lead. He, had, he did quite a lot in it. And there wasn't a little, because they used to do that all the time. If somebody had died, before the, their episode of something was shown, they go, and since that programme was made, we regret to say that the actor George Raystrick has died. And they didn't do that, and I was really cross. And they certainly wouldn't do that today for, for, for somebody who's not a household name. But they used to do it all the time. I mean, they did it for Noel Dyson on The Heartbeat. They did it for Harold Innocent on The, the, the Paradise of Death. Um, remember them doing it for Dino Shafiq on, I think, a repeat of It Ain't Our Hot Mum. And I used to like it when that happened. It gave you a sort of connection in it. It made you feel that, you know, the people making things were sort of special because they are, because they come into your homes. Um, and I think an acknowledgement of that is nice, which probably explains why my Facebook feed is just full of going. I have comedian friends who go, who, who I know have said to other comedians, what, do you, most comedians put jokes up on their Facebook and Twitter? Toby's, Toby just seems to go, that actor from that thing has died. And I, it, 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 and I, I yeah, I... Um, I, I do behave like I'm in some sort of morbid dressing room. Um, <laughs> sort of <laughs> grease paint obituaries. Uh, he's, oh, he's brilliant, Aubrey Woods. I really like him. Um, but yeah, George Raystrip, well, yeah, was in, a, was in a show with Bernard Cribbins, I, I recall. Um, oh, he's really roughed up, actually, in this Doctor. It's quite... Uh, the, the, it, you know, we're, we're pre... Holmes and Hinchcliffe, where things are really sadistic. But actually, this does has elements of this, particularly Andrew Carr here is, um, I don't think he gets a name, is he? He's Chief Guard or something. Um, I'm sure he gets a name in the book. And he's not just some random guard. He's, he's the guy that takes over, isn't he, from the, from the, from the, from the control. No, he's the guy that takes over from the controller in this. 
but the guy that takes over from the controller in the book has a name. Uh, I can't remember. Um, but anyway, he's chief guard. And, uh, but he's making the most of it. He's, he's doing some good good acting with his whip there. And, and you, he looks really pissed off. It's, it's uh, you know, for this this point in the show's history, this is quite sort of nails. And, and Perk was well, well up for it. He's, you know, he's not, he's not having it with this sadist. And Andrew Carr does a, does a nice job. Um, I had quite a sad story about him that I, 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 I probably can't, can't say because it's, it's not in the public domain, but um, yeah, he, and this is Peter Hill. And I, I, and I seem to recall, and George Racefrick all died within a, I say a short time of each other. It was probably five years or so. Early 90s, I think these two died. I think George Raystrick must have been around that time as well. So it seemed to me that every, every episode three of Day of the Daleks was, was sort of gradually losing people. Um, we'll be outside if you need us. He's, he's, yeah, this is more, he's more than just a guard. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's investing it with a lot of character. Yeah, Peter Hill, I think, had been a, a regular in crossroads hadn't he and, and I think had been I'm sure I read somewhere he'd asked to be killed off so that he wouldn't be tempted to go back because you know uh, 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 you know and uh, the security of a regular part in something is very tempting for an actor so if you if you if you fr stop yourself from from having access to something it, it forces you to seek other opportunities and perhaps have more variety I think that would be suicide now um, because there's so little being made. But in those days, you know, you took your chances and you went, well, I'd get an episode of this drama that week and that sitcom the next week, then a bit of theatre, but, but so much less is being made now. Um, and uh, I think he died on Christmas Day. Peter Hill, did he? That, that's, that's, I think he did, that's... I'm, I'm not swearing to that, but uh, I, I, that's something that's, that's lurking in the back of my head. Um, uh, but yeah, I remember, I remember reading about it in the, I think in the stage or in Doc 2 magazine. Um, but it, yes, it seemed to be that the Day of the Daleks went through a phase of his, oh, I love, I love that little moment between them where you know the manager just goes don't trust him and the doctor clocks it again that little that a bit like the t don't tell it to the marine things where you're slightly just ahead and you feel complicit in uh in in proceedings from the goodies point of view which always gives you a bit of hope uh but this is this is nice because he's only, i mean he's only in this episode the manager isn't he but he gets a, a total story you know he, he comes in, he has the bit with the doctor, but he, then he has that clash with the guard. And then he has this bit with the... Uh, and now, of course, he's got this bit with the controller, but we know that he's a good guy. Um, uh, but we also know that he's a good guy in a very tenuous position. Uh, and your family. And that speaks volumes. And, oh, and, and you really feel for him. And, the, you know, the camera's trusting the actors by going really close in on both of them and they both totally deliver a sort of inscrutable polite threat from Aubrey Woods who we also sort of know is a well you know is a good guy really he's doing all his stuff Peter, uh, that that sort of trying to hold it together the shaking that Peter Hill's doing there is great that's lovely and he waits until you know the, the control is gone and I, I don't know why his secret radio to the rebels just happens to be in the doctor's cell, but uh, I, I'll take it because, uh, well, I'll take it because we need that bit of information. And, uh, oh, the, but the poor old manager, I mean, he's, uh, he's about to get got, isn't he? And that's, that's it. I mean, what does he get? Four or five minutes of screen time? But he's a totally rounded character in terms of what he contributes to the story is more than just Im imparting a bit of information um, uh, you know he gets a little you call it an arc 
nowadays, but he gets a, he gets a progression and a journey, and it's rather sad. Um, I've missed a bit, haven't I? Where he said that now I've told you the year. Uh, I was looking for it last episode, but I think I think a little bit too late. Uh, I do like Joe's costume in this. Um, and Pertwee can carry it off, can't he? He's so... I do understand Chris's point about the fact that sometimes when the Doctor thinks he's being clever, he's actually being a bit of an arse. Um, but, but you know how sometimes you let rogues get away with things that, that, that somebody like me wouldn't get away with because a charming rogue, you sort of go, no, I'll take that from you because you're a charming rogue. I know I'm not a charming rogue. I think it's the same with Pertwee. Sometimes where you go, oh, you're a pretentious git. Because it's Pertwee, because of how he looks, because of how he holds himself, uh, and, and, and oh, they like being happy and prosperous. That's great. That's killer stuff from the Doctor. I, I, you sort of take it. I, I think... I, I think he inhabits the role of the Doctor so well. Um... And, and does things that, if they were said by other people, you wouldn't like them, and yet, yet somehow he gets away with it. He wears things that I would love to be able to wear what John Pertwee wears and not look like a tool, but I would look like a tool. I'm also I'm not elegant like him. He's very he holds himself very well, but I would look like an absolute burke in that. He looks great. Um, and what an interesting piece of casting he was, because he was the, you know, he was the radio comic, the funny voice man. And he, and he, you know, he rises to the occasion with this dramatic stuff, like with that guard. And this bit here, he's, you know, he's not accepting it from the controller at all. The, but the controller's trying to maintain this sort of veneer of civility, and the doctor's not having it. Good for you, doctor. And Joe has been completely taken in. <laughs> Poor old Joe. Yeah, superior set of quizzling. They, they, they use the word quizzling in this, don't they? Which was a really good word to learn early. I remember I was quite young when I, I, I learned it. Did I learn it from this? I don't know if I did. I think I learned it at junior school, but it was a, it was a Q word. And words beginning with Q were few and far between. Of course, this is five, it's five years since Evil of the Daleks, um, which was the last time. Oh, and they've done a trailer for this, haven't they, which I think is lost. Um, and in fact, I know it's lost because I've not seen it. It's not on the DVD uh, of the Daleks on London Landmarks. And I think, was that Robert Jewell, the original, you know, one of the original Dalek operators? I think that was one of his, that was his last... Doctor Who booking. Um, ah, now I remember this in the book. Because she hits him on the top of the head and he goes, I, I, I think we had an urban myth in our household that the that the Ogrons were only vulnerable at the top of their head rather than actually if you hit somebody near where their brain is, it's going to knock them out. But I think it was a bit like, that was like the Sontaran's probic vent. The Ogrons um, were susceptible only if you hit them on the top of the head. I don't know if that was because that was how it was explained in the book or, or just the picture showed it like that. I don't know. I can't remember. Um, but like the, like the, like, like the mouse moustache, it was a thing that was my assumed knowledge and history of, of the Ogrons that actually uh, just wasn't true. Um, oh, <laughs> this, is the, this is the slowest. Now they are. Ah, OK, the leap. The Ogron who leapt, that was brilliant. But then... <laughs> They really aren't. They really aren't in a hurry to 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 chase the uh, slightly speeded up, I think, uh, tricycle. But you know that's that's funky. You get uh, a, a new piece of equipment, and John Pertwee goes, "Oh, I'd, I could go on that." Um, and that and that's quite a, that's quite a nifty that's quite a nifty sequence. I, I'd remembered that being worse than that. I'd remembered the Ogrons moving far slower, and that's a brilliant shot. I love that the Ogrons in vast numbers on location, look terrific. Um, all right, Monica. Uh, Monica is given the incorrect Monica in the closing. 
titles. Um, a Valentine Palmer has written a book about the Titanic because his great great uncle was Light Honor, who's the Kenneth Moore guy in uh, in Night to Remember, who was you know the the highest officer to survive. Uh, and I th and I think it's a bit conspiracy theory. And I've interviewed Valentine Palmer, but we didn't talk about that. Um, and he, he, he sought me out for my Who's Round podcast, bless him. I love this. I love this, that the uh, you think, oh, they're just using the, the titles as a bit of background, which is nifty. You know, that's a nice, in, in the same way that the signal how round of the Hartnell titles is sometimes used on Dalek monitors. So that's quite nice. But actually, that's the, I think that's the only time in the classic era, well, certainly in the colour era of, of these sorts of single caption closing credits where the you know an actor's name appears over the action because normally it cuts to the title sequence and the names it doesn't doesn't sort of fade fade over senior guard not chief guard andrew Carr. um so yeah actually do the doctor's name appearing on the on the screen like that is rare and, and it does that because it's fading into because it's doing that thing like it does with the faces of the titles you know, join in with the thing on the monitor. But there's a precedent for that because Dalek monitors have used Doctor Who title sequences before. It's, it's, it's like they, their spare time, they watch Doctor Who to wind themselves up and have, and have, and have, nicked, the, uh, uh, have nicked the graphic design uh, to wind themselves up even more as their screensaver. Let's use the title sequence as our screensaver. Oh, but those, these Daleks don't talk. Let's use the title sequence. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so... Oh, that's interesting because I would have, I would have said the the trike chase was was sort of in the middle of the episode. It comes really close to the end, doesn't it? Um, uh, and, and I know the end of episode four will come as a bit of a surprise as well. Um, so it, it feels to me like this is a dense story that's rather packed. Um, the, you know, the end comes as a surprise every time, uh, or maybe it's just because I'm chuntering on <laughs> anyway what's my favorite thing about that episode i think it's i think it's it can't be the fact that is it the fact that john pertwee's name appears at the end and that the titles the titles blend with the picture oh, yeah i'm never going to get a chance to do that again because that's the only time that that happens i know the you know the credits appear in the 60s the credits appear over the picture and go up but that's like i think that's slightly different but the title sequence because there's no title sequence in the closing of the 60s episodes i like that and it and it and it and it, and it sort of ties in with the whole visual inventiveness and the using monitors to blend from one scene to another and this is like the the you know the ultimate iteration of that is that the the, the monitor actually blends into the closing title sequence so yeah i think that's a legitimate it's not just that moment. It's that it's that sort of visual motif um, that 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 keeps reoccurring and yeah culminates in leading us into the closing titles for episode three. I bet Chris hasn't chosen that. <laughs> Might have done, uh, but let's see. Chris has chosen for episode three. For episode three, um, I was a little bit small for choice. I think there were a number of things that I could have chosen as my favourite over this episode. Uh, but I've gone with the motorised tricycle chase. It's possibly the shortest chase sequence in history, but it's absolutely amazing. Um, Pertwee covers about three square feet of ground uh, when he's being chased <laughs> on this tricycle, uh, and then he's eventually captured, and the Daleks reveal that he really is the Doctor, as some stills of Troughton and Hartnell get projected on a screen behind him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I thought the tricycle chase was better than I'd remembered. Uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I've remembered it being awful, and uh, and it's not. But apart from the couple of bits you can see where the ogrons sort of saunter very slowly. Um, uh, come back, my liege. Um, but I'm happy with my choice as well. Okay, uh, that was the end of episode three. I wonder if there's a way that I can make the titles, the title sequence, blend in with the. I'm editing this on iMovie. I've got no idea. <laughs> it might make the right pig's ear of it. But just imagine that I'm blending the title sequence in with the pictures and on the podcast, just by. Um, <laughs> but uh, I will speak to you for Day of the Daleks, episode four. Thanks for joining me for episode three. Ta-ta.
you'd uh, like to hear a little bit more from me, uh, but you are too old to enrol on the A-level law course at the FE college that I teach at, but you are a fan of trivia that's liberally punctuated with bad language, um, then you can tune into my occasional podcast. Chris Boyle didn't know that. You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, and I'm sure loads of other podcast providers as well. Um, thank you very much, and goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>